here again with Ardeth, and it was one of those conversations that I was looking at the list of speakers, and we were like, well, we interviewed them at Content Marketing World, and now that we're at B2B, I'm like, no, I want Ardeth back on. Like, <laughs> we didn't finish that conversation. The 30 minutes ended that conversation. So how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's fun to be here. I'm excited that we get to continue our conversation. Awesome. And so this time I want to talk about the new topic that you presented on or new to the, the show. And that is the idea of making your content maybe more valuable versus having more of it. Yeah, absolutely. We were talking about how to scale. And so it's really funny when I came up with the topic, I started thinking about it and I went out and did some searching on it. And Everybody who talks about scale talks about it as a volume play. And so I sat there and I thought about it and I thought, what does more get you? You know, what you really need is a strategy that performs so that you can repeat it and scale the performance, not necessarily the content. Mm -hmm. So scaling content marketing isn't about scaling content, it's about scaling outcomes. Yeah, and I think there are so many examples of other people who produce content. So whether it's an artist who produces a piece of art or if it's somebody who produces music or somebody who produces you know the content that we write it's not getting it out every single day getting three pieces out picasso would not be as valuable if he just was pushing numbers right the starving mm -hmm. artist syndrome he took his time if your favorite musician put a new single out every week it might be annoying right you yeah you, overwhelm yeah you want to if it's not valuable it's just you're going to start to lose that brand equity. You're going to start to lose that that excitement about the release. Mm -hmm. And so I think so many marketers forget that. They're just they're down to the numbers. They need more views. How do you get more views? Well, you start to just keep putting out more and more really bad stuff that gets 10 views because 10, 10 articles with 10 views is 100 views. I know. What, what's the statistic that came out recently? Like most content gets less than eight views or shares per post. Yeah. And then there's that other one that's really bad. The latest I saw was 95% of content is never viewed. It's just wasted. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the money involved in that that's going down the tube. You know, it's, we can't just keep throwing money at the problem, you know, and creating more and more without a plan. So it's interesting because I love that spin on revenue, that conversation that you're generating something for your, your company. You're, you're hopefully getting interest. You're hopefully taking somebody along the journey. You're bringing them into those new segments. And that is something that you truly need to woo someone in for, right? You need to take the time and say, what would $1 versus $5 do of value for this person? Or maybe $100 worth of value or whatever you can put in, that, put in your mind that would say, is this a problem and are they really, are you solving it with the content? And I, just so many people don't take that approach to looking at the yeah. content they're creating. Well, you got to consider my background too. The way I came into doing this is as the president of a startup technology company. So I was the only non-techie there. So marketing by its very nature felt to me. Mm -hmm. And when you're the president of a company and you're responsible for its finances, everything you do yeah. has to contribute to that top line, bottom line, however you want to look at it, yeah. right? And so on top of that, I've run companies for 30 years. So I look at the big picture where a lot of marketers who've worked for enterprise companies have never had that responsibility or that view mm -hmm. perspective, you know, the big picture view of it. So, and as a consultant, I don't get hired and paid unless something happens for the clients I work for. So top of mind for me always is revenue. Yeah. And so how do you actually figure out how to sell content marketing programs through to the executive team? There has to be something they care about and that's gonna be revenue. How are we driving business, right? What's changing because we're marketing in this particular way rather than talking incessantly about our feeds and speeds, mm -hmm. right? Or whatever it is that we've always talked about. What makes it different and more compelling? And so just by an extension of that, if it doesn't drive revenue, it's probably not doing the thing it needs to do. Yeah. So, but the thing for me was always, I had to work really hard to back into, you know, the outcome, right? Yeah. The, or the revenue. Now we have technology. 
where you can follow people. You can look at patterns of activity. You can say this piece of content has been touched by everybody who bought this particular solution. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out how that plays a role in that decision process, right? You have the access to all of this data that can tell you all this different stuff. And that we've never had before. Yeah. And so what we really need to do is take advantage of that. The problem with data though, is that unless you know what questions to ask of it, you're not gonna get back the right answers. Yeah. So you have to really think about, it's why really important to me is every piece of content has to have a goal. You have to have a goal for every channel, for every persona at every stage of the buying process or whatever, so you know what data to look for, what to ask from it to figure out is what you're doing working. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, you that goal attached to what was the investment, like. Most people don't even know how much the content actually cost them to create mm -hmm. and what that team looks like and what the, the overhead looks like. And then when you start to see those measurable goals, you can say, hey, that content took us five days worth of work to do. And it had such a higher volume of return than all these one day articles that really have no return. Maybe we should stop and consider taking a little bit longer, building bigger assets, looking at the the journey where mm -hmm. they fit in there and did they actually did anything produce value yeah. you know what's really cool what i got really excited about i found some research that was done in the last year by aberdeen group and what they did was they looked at um the success rate of marketers or companies with buyer aligned content so aligned to the buyer's journey right the different stages and the personas versus companies without that alignment and the cool thing is in addition to all the other benefits, marketing contribution to revenue was at 12.3%. So if the standard is about 10% of revenues are allocated to marketing, guess what? Marketing just went from a cost center to a revenue yeah. center, right? Because they're now 12.3%. Sue says they can't get higher, right? But in addition to that, the company as an overall entity produced I can't remember now, something like 16 or 18% more revenue than those without alignment. But the fact that you can attribute that back to marketing mm -hmm. now and say, okay, we're actually having a greater impact on revenue than what it costs to run us. That's huge for yeah. marketing, right? When has that ever been true? Absolutely. And it's, it's one of those things that you teams need to look at this the next 10 years as we really have to establish a foothold in the organization for what we call the marketing department. We need to be at those boardroom meetings. We need to have to not be underneath sales or not be underneath IT to truly have a place because customers are going to be far, far harder to find. They're going to take more nurturing beforehand. That is, you know, easy touch, no interaction. And, the only people that can do that in the organization are the marketing teams working with everyone to make sure that happens. I know. Well, as I look at it and I look at all of the trends and the predictions and what's happening with the customer experience and how marketing is ending up owning that, God forbid that we still don't know our customers if mm. we're expected to drive the customer experience and take ownership of that all the way through customer service you know, for the entire life cycle rather than just driving leads into the sales funnel and saying, okay, we're done now, carry on. You know, I mean, we need to become more conscious about what we're doing and think it further through. And so one of the things I talked about in my session today was this idea of the continuum versus the campaign, because as marketers focused on campaigns, which the problem with them is they start and they stop and then they leave people hanging and mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't do what they need to do to help people solve problems. But on top of that, it means we're always reinventing the wheel because we're always saying, okay, this campaign just ended. We need a new campaign. What are we going to run? Instead, if we look at the continuum and we're creating from status quo where they sit today, why should I care? All the way through recognizing they have a problem and the steps they need to take to figure out how to solve it and choose to solve it. All the way through there, you've got that continuous stream. Mm -hmm. So you can either add more stuff in when you find a gap or pull stuff out that's not working. And what you end up doing instead of reinventing the wheel is working with a wheel that actually functions. So you can continue to refine it all along the way. Now I have clients that are on like their fourth year using nurture programs we set up. And what they keep doing is saying, 
you know, analyzing which of the content is working, contributing, what do they need to switch out, updating things for that could go obsolete, like statistics and that kind of stuff. But they're in maintenance, you know, and continuous improvement mode rather than, oh, God, it's Tuesday. I need a blog post. Yeah. What should I write? Yeah. You know? And it's so much great feedback you could get from your customers in that approach. Mm -hmm. When you stop thinking of starting and stopping, think of your favorite app. Think of Facebook. If they would have stopped at version one and said, okay, we're done. The campaign's done. Mm. Here's out. Only schools would have been involved with that mm. EDUs. Everything would have been like on this day because Facebook used to say is, right? That was, they always started your post and it would be Jeff Julian is yeah. and doing stuff. Nobody would be using it. They, Nobody they can, would care. <laughs> exactly. They continued to listen to the customers and change and grow and evolve. Uh, There's no reason our marketing efforts should not do the same thing. That's true. So it's just, it's really interesting. And I'm working on a, a, well, it's not really a project. I have a client right now that sends me content and says, can you create landing pages and emails, email copy for this stuff that their subject matter experts are pumping out. And sometimes I open it up and I get a white paper that's really compelling and well done. And I can, there's a bunch of great phrases I can pull out and use mm -hmm. to build the, you know, the introductory content for it and all this. And sometimes I just went through one this morning where I opened it up and went, oh, come on. And it was so dry and so boring, you know, and I kept looking for Here's things your email to address back. We don't and want I, this anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> I know. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? And I was finally able to sit and think about it in a little differently and pull something out of it. But I really just wanted to rewrite the whole piece, except mm. it had already gone through production and, you know, all of that. But I was just like, geez. And then I started thinking about, okay, same audience. If you get this piece, you're going to be really happy. Mm -hmm. If you get this piece, your eyes are going to roll back in your head. You're going to hate it. You're going to hit delete. And are you going to open the next thing they send to you? Mm -hmm. You know? And so it's not something I have control over because I'm just, you know, providing whatever they ask for at that point. I work on strategy at a different department, but when you look at it and you think about it, you think, okay, what is the overall impression that we're creating? You know, and they're creating it because they need to put a paper out. They're not creating it as part of any kind of cohesive, you know, compelling story that provides momentum and reasons for people to take next steps. Your CMO just handed you a global campaign with a short deadline and the request to lead with video. You're given a team of you and well, you. This campaign is asking for 15 videos that need to create awareness and engagement across multiple online destinations, drive demand and lead gen, and measure performance. Whew, calm down. Everything's going to be okay. We've got you covered. First things first, we're going to set you up with Video Marketing Suite, which will allow you to access everything you need from a single online location. And it's made for marketers, so you can easily run your campaign yourself. With just a couple of clicks, your videos are uploaded, automatically optimized to work across all screens and devices. You can distribute to your social channels to reach audiences where they are, and then drive them back to a customized branded video portal using Gallery, which you can create quickly, easily, and in multiple languages. For live events, Brightcove offers an easy to use live streaming interface. And after you're done streaming, trim the video and post it on demand for people who missed the event. We'll even help you create interactive elements to optimize video for lead generation. To make sense of all this, our analytics platform tracks a number of statistics in an easy to use UI. This data feeds into leading marketing automation platforms. You can see who watched and for how long and what other content they consumed. Then you know what to create and who it's for. We're Brightcove. We'll help ensure that your video marketing is a success. And again, it just it goes back to having personas, knowing who you're writing to, having real people that represent those personas, and then running stuff by them, right? Mm -hmm. You think of movies, right? They'll, they'll pull the first 15 minutes together. They'll bring people in. They'll say, what do they think? They're measuring them. They're looking mm -hmm. at the interactions. If they don't like it, they don't produce the movie. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's... It's a big cost, and that's the way we got to start looking at content like that. So mm -hmm. have those SMEs or those personas that we really want to reach that we trust the person to say, all right, tell me honestly, 
What'd yeah, but there's always a but with that, yeah. you know. I have also seen it turn into the nightmare of too much feedback, mm -hmm. you know, where they're thinking about what they personally like yep. versus what would a bunch of people similar to them like. Yeah. And when you start doing that and everybody gets to say, well, I really want this sentence in there and not that one. Yeah. And everybody starts doing that. You got a mess on your hands yeah. and it becomes incoherent. And I was talking to my session today about using the Fleisch Kincaid score. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. And you can access it in, in Word. And, you know, for some companies, and I work with a lot of tech companies, I get content. The first thing I do is do that. Yeah. Right. Because I want to know. And I'm seeing reading ease of 10 when 100 is, you know, optimum and grade level of 27. How many people do you know that have been through 27 <laughs> years of school? And I mean, progressive, not the yeah. same ones, but 27 years of school. And I'm like, maybe if you have a triple PhD or something, yeah. you know, or you're a brain surgeon yeah, or, or just somebody you know. who never graduated. <laughs> but, but one of the things we don't ever do when we're assessing our content is look at what's the tone and style difference, mm -hmm. like in resonating, you know, we look at other things, but we don't really look at that. And for me, the, the telltale sign for me is I got a piece of content from a client the other day to edit for them and realized I was sitting on the plane and I had read the first paragraph three times and had no clue <laughs> what I was reading. Yeah. And I thought if somebody does that, when they get your content, are they going to ever read that? Yeah. No. You're on an airplane. It's like you're, you're locked. Say, I know. I'm and a captive had, audience. Like, exactly. I can't just click away and go to another <laughs> yeah. website, you know? And it didn't even work. And, and, you know, but I mean, it's, you know, one of the things I tell a lot of people when I'm doing editorial guidance for them is chop off the first two paragraphs yeah. and then start from there. Exactly. Look at what you have. Because we always, when we're writing, we need stuff to get started, right? And so we'll kind of ramble a little bit mm -hmm. or meander our way into it. But the thing we forget is we have eight seconds yeah. to engage somebody. And I think it's less than that. You know, quite frankly, if I can't figure out your first sentence, I'm not reading anymore. Yeah. Do you know? Unless you're paying me to do it. Exactly. Which is true in that case, right? <laughs> and yeah, I love the whole, let me know what I'm going to get if I finish this article, the executive summary or whatever you want to call it. Something that's like, here's what I plan to deliver if you can keep reading. And then after that. Let's not fluff our way into it. Let's not beat around the bush, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's, and we're not trying to fill 30 minutes here. Let's just, you know, have yeah. that conversation. Well, it's the same reason why speakers should never start a presentation talking about who I, who they are, who their company is, mm -hmm. you know, blah, 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 whatever. They should get right into here's what we're talking about today and here's why it's important to you. Same thing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love seeing because we've been to a lot of conferences. We've spoken for, you know, decades now. And you see these speakers that come out and they're just they do the same thing. They come out with content that's like boring, dull. It's like if I could get up, if I would have. Already. I know, but here's the thing. At the conferences we go to, they're likely teaching someone how to do what they say yeah. they can do. Yeah. And they're doing that. You know, I mean, how weird is that? And I just sit there and I think. Oh my God, do you realize you're saying I am an expert at content marketing, but yet you're standing up there talking about yourself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the irony of it is just, yeah. you know, oh, I just I, sit there and I think, okay. I've, you know, <laughs> I always, anything I want to write that's going to be, you know, against somebody, I usually write it, save it, send it to myself. Uh -huh. And then look back the next day and say, what does that make any sense? But there's been several times I've set these keynotes saying, you just said people don't want to hear from you about you. And the rest of the presentation, all you did was tell me about why you guys won. <laughs> it's like, I know yeah. they, there could be some harsh feedback. Yeah. We all we all get it. Right. They send it to you. The last one, the last time I saw you, I was sick. I had a cold and so I got feedback. Artist must have a cold because she doesn't look really well and she usually does much better than that. And I thought, oh, darn, you know, but I did. I had a cold, you know, but it was just no leeway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I paid money <laughs> to see you. You know, you got to be there to perform. I but know. so I'm when you're thinking about, you know, these struggling marketers who, you know, they just don't have time to document a strategy. You know, they're just work, 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 work. How important is it for them to just like if they stopped creating content today, what would be that first step you would tell them to take? You know, this is the big deal. They won't stop. 
I'm working on a project right now. The company has never done content marketing before. They've always been product focused. Mm -hmm. So we're developing personas. We're mapping customer journeys. We're in the middle of those projects. And the mandate from above is now we need a Q4 nurture program in place. Launch it next week. To talk to who about what? Yeah. You know? And so the CMO came and said, you know, we have to do something. We can't just do nothing. And I said, but we are doing something. We're planning for your 2017 programs that are going to hit it out of the park because we're going to be so darn relevant. Yeah, yeah but I got to do something for Q4 because the CEO's having a fit. Okay, great. So what do you want us to do? Well, I'll do a nurture program. Great. Are we going to nurture about what? <laughs> We just did a database assessment and figured out that probably two thirds of their data is dirty. So I'm kind of like, no, we're gonna engage. And what should we talk to them about? Because we're not done with our personas yet or our customer journeys. Or... So finally we decided, okay, let's use this as a database cleansing opportunity and see if we can at least re-engage them. Mm -hmm. We'll do something that sort of hits the mark as close as we can get it, Yeah. right? Given that. We can't segment until we've cleaned up our data and see if we can just get them to respond and clean up the data with a little progressive profiling or something mm -hmm. and get some activity going. So when we do come out with really relevant stuff at the beginning of the year, we've kind of got something already in the works. And so it was kind of, and I said, well, we have to figure out how are we going to benchmark so that when we do start the new programs, we have something to measure against. Yeah. You know, and how are we going to clean the data and get our segmentation done and all of those things so that we're ready to put into play what we have with the personas and customer journeys. And they were like, well, can't we report on revenues? And I said, when's the last time you actively touched this database? Oh, about a year ago. <laughs> and I said, you have a three-year sales cycle. Yeah. What are you going to do in three months? Exactly. Right? <laughs> So, have but you ever opened an email and said, I'm buying today? Yeah. Click, right? <laughs> and I think I'd like to spend about $2.5 million right now. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, but it's like activity is more important mm -hmm. than strategy or performance. I sat through a session last year and it was Jay Bear's session at the pre workshop, and he had some other people speaking from other companies there. And I won't mention the company name, but they said, we do white papers. That's all we, that's what we've always done. It takes about six months to produce a white paper. So we go in and we were putting out these white papers and we were getting a hundred views. I was like, that's an expensive hundred views. Right. And they were like, well, and then we put a slide share up and we get like 20,000 views of the slide share. And it's like, okay, she's going to like, we're all like, and so we just changed it up and we went with slide shares. No, it went back to. So we started producing more white papers and then that one got like a couple hundred views and we did slide share and the guy sitting next to me goes, his hand and he goes, why don't you just start doing slide shares? And they go, because we're such and such company. We do white papers. <laughs> it's like, it just okay. doesn't make any sense, yeah. right? It boggles the mind. And sometimes it's that in your face and we still don't get it Yeah, because of the way we've always done it. You know, and the interesting part about it is that the way we've always done it is now what, like a two month span before mm -hmm. the way we've always done it changes to something else. Yeah. You know, and we have to be more agile. We have to think about how can we address purpose and meaning at a faster clip, mm -hmm. not with more, but with more purpose and meaning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. So it sounded really strange <laughs> as a follow up to that, but. But, you know, it's we're not being thoughtful enough. Yeah, I, I, I always teach people about the sustainable pace. It's like what in, in running they have this thing called the, you know, the, the conversational pace. So if you can imagine running and actually holding a conversation, you get to a place where you can do it and you could just keep running mm -hmm. and have like a 30 minute conversation like, oh, wow, look, we just ran six miles. Yeah. And the reason you could do that is because you built that endurance that allows you to keep working at that pace without burning mm -hmm. all your energy away. The minute you go over that pace, you're done, mm -hmm. right? Everything just starts tanking. Your body starts going against you. Your brain purposely starts talking against you. 
and you will stop at some point soon. Well, I think our marketing teams are in that exhausted mode, not thinking straight and not working at that sustainable well, because we're pace. hamsters mm -hmm. instead of thoughtful people. And it's going to take it's going to take somebody with backbone in any organization. Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that I've always noticed in marketing is that we tend to look at our competition and think we have to do at least what they're doing, if not more. Mm -hmm. So with the propensity to look at more is scale, right? We're all out there pumping out more content and, and then we see our competitor doing something like that and we think, oh, we gotta match that. We've gotta publish five times a day now instead of three times or whatever that thing is, right? And so we start doing these things because we see other people doing it, but that's not good enough reason why mm -hmm. to change anything. So what if your competition is pumping out five blog posts a day because they're scared, they're losing their edge, instead of because it's something that's actually driving business? Yeah. So what if what you're doing is actually replicating their fear and panic mode rather than something that's going to be good for your business? We don't stop and think about that. Yeah. We just say, so-and-so is doing this, we got to do that. But do we really? No. Yeah. What if we put out one really thoughtful post every Tuesday and our subs subscriber base grows to a million where our computer's pumping out crap five times a day and we steal all their subscriber base and they're not building that level of readers. Today, real time is the only time that counts. To stay relevant, you have to stay ahead. Your customers want the right information, right now, wherever they are. So how do you meet the demands of today's customers? By marketing and context. Context accounts for a customer's interaction with your brand. So each touch builds on the next, creating more meaningful experiences for your customers. At Sitecore, we call this context marketing. To do it well, you need marketing technology that has three things contextual intelligence, content management, and omni-channel automation. Contextual intelligence gives you the information you need about your consumers. So the content you manage is more relevant and is automatically delivered wherever your customers are. The Sitecore Experience platform was built for context marketing so you can create a more personalized customer experience. Demand more from your marketing technology. Demand more from marketing. Own the experience. Sitecore. That's why I love the Anne Handley introducing the whole turtle concept and slow marketing and the, yeah. the idea that it's just not about running through this, but it's truly slow, thoughtful executions with somebody in mind and delivering mm -hmm. value. And I think we could all do more of that. It's far more, I think it's far more important than the document strategy because it is the documented strategy, but it's that taking the time and just turning off the computer and saying, all right, what's valuable? What's, mm -hmm. what is, what's gonna help us edge out? And then start to get the data that you need to make those arguments. Don't just be scrappy and go out and do a bunch of stuff, but really start measuring the whole side of the conversation. Yeah. And well, I think we need to start from where we are. And I think we need to go back and look at what we've done and truly assess how it worked. You have the data now. Mm -hmm. So that statistic that says 95% of content is wasted, What's your 95%, yeah. right? What's working, what's not, and in what ways is it working? Yeah. And you gotta start from where you are. I know a lot of companies that have a ton of content and they'll come to me and say, okay, let's create personas and let's do customer journey maps and let's create a strategy. Okay, now we need all this content. I'm like, but what about all the content you already have? And they're like, well, that doesn't have anything to do with any of this. And I'm like, sure it does. It may, it may need to be revised, it may need to have a different perspective applied to it because of a persona focus. You know, we may need to flip it from product to, you know, pain point or whatever, but we can probably make use of that. 
instead of throwing it all away mm -hmm. and reinventing the wheel all over again, can, we can now assess it and figure out what can we use. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, I'll find a really good, what they call a paper, and the first two and a half pages are great, and then they sink into the product sales pitch spiel, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you lop off that two and a half pages and turn it into a blog post, you know, crisp it up a little bit, yeah. that's perfect content, you know, that's reusable. And it has some good stuff in it. It just happens to have that other five pages of yicky sales pitch that <laughs> needs to go away. Yeah, you exactly. Know? And so we need to understand how to take what we have and make more out of it before we just throw the baby out with the bathwater and, you know, start inventing all new stuff. And another reason for that is to save SEO value that may have been built up over time, link, va link value in the search engines that you may have accrued. Or you could switch out the PDF and load a new one, saving that link and make it more relevant, change up the landing page copy, whatever, you oh, yeah. know, I and mean, reuse. And it's, it's so important with apps like Pocket that people are starting to use and Evernote that you got to imagine every page on your site, if you thought it was valuable at some point, somebody might have a bookmark mm -hmm. and somebody might be saying, I'm saving this in my archive for things to go back. And if you didn't, give them something of similar value when mm -hmm. they go back to it, man, you just, yeah, you know, know, you, you hurt the archive, right? <laughs> yeah. And you can burn all of that, you know, cloud, that meaning, that connection that you've had with them before, mm -hmm. you know, I've done that before and I go back to that link and get a 303 error, you know, or whatever, a 404 and nothing's there mm -hmm. and they haven't redirected properly or they drop me back on the home page, which mm -hmm. gee, that's helpful. Always do that to people. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so, but I save stuff all the time because mm -hmm. I think I'll go back and look at it later. I can use it for something else. So I stick it in Evernote with a note on it or whatever in case I'm looking for something on a specific topic because I'm always doing research. Yeah. But, you know, it's amazing what we do with our content without thinking about mm -hmm. what's possible. Yeah. What if we just refresh this page and made it better? Exactly. You just know, look at the engagement in your email. Who yeah. opened? And maybe when they opened, they saved, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get that. You don't get that metric. So well, you know what I always love is what's the what's the current wisdom about tweets? They last thirty minutes, yeah, or less. I get retweets of stuff I tweet three days later. Yeah. I just had one from a week ago. Yeah, retweeted. So, what's the thirty minute thing? I'm yeah. not getting it. Yeah, LinkedIn you statuses. Know? I put out. You know, one of the shows from Content Marketing World, I put that out like three weeks ago. I got a private message today saying, hey, I just watched that that show that I saw on LinkedIn. And then constantly it's like so-and-so commented on it and there's another like. And it's like that thing is still alive. The engines are they're showing them up again. And is people it are searching. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yours is doing very well. Right. Um, but it's one of those things. It was. It's just like these things do live longer. Mm -hmm. And this. SEO is not the only thing that people are doing to find content. And so no. keeping it alive, keeping it there, you know, you, once it's out there, always treat it as a permanent link and you're going to have to redirect it to something of value or you're going to disrupt. Well, I think the thing that we forget is that everybody's stream isn't a live stream. So for example, I'm not sitting on Twitter all day long. So if you tweet at 8 a.m., and I log in at 8.30, you know, I may have missed you, except that I follow you. Mm -hmm. So I'll go look at my group that I follow, and I'll probably see that tweet, because I'll scan through the last couple hours of yeah. tweets to see. We all have what, our, our right? list of things yeah. that we actually read on Twitter. And but, then... you know, I very rarely will see something in real time, you know, because I'm not sitting there. Yeah. And so... I think that's something we don't think about because when we actually physically tweet, well, we're not doing it in real time. A lot of people are automating, which drives me absolutely crazy, but that's a whole nother conversation. If I could kill the robots, I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, social media. Yeah, let's automate that. The analogy I always I say is that. like, why are the answer machines calling us now? Because like the emails are all automated. The phone calls are all automated. The tweets are all automated. It's like, I... I absolutely hate, like, you'll call somebody and they're like, hello, hello. Oh, ha, ha just kidding. This is a voicemail. And that's what, that's what automation does to me. It's like, I feel it's personal. And then I get to the point and I'm like, wait a minute. I just felt like I needed to reply to this guy. 
And how was part of a drip? Oh, I'm never going to reply to another one. Well, even worse, I had one where I could see the same number calling me repeatedly. And it was this sales person from a company and they were leaving voicemails, stupid voicemails, but they were leaving them. So the next time I saw the number come in, I thought I'm going to put an end to this. And I answered it and they hung up. <laughs> and they get a real I'm person. Like, they're they've like, been trying to talk to me. I actually answer the phone. They hang up. And so, the absolute worst is the direct message. That. The follow direct messages mm-hmm. from Twitter. I or think, LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, oh, thanks LinkedIn for connecting. Is... By the way, here's all about my company. Exactly. I was selling you. Ha ha. You felt it's like, does anybody ever go, oh, I got to buy now. I fell for it. No, they go, okay, I'm going to go unconnect from you right now. Exactly. Or unfollow you or and whatever you. And I'll have those moments where I just go off on a tirade and I yell at the sales guy saying, you didn't even do any research on me. You don't even know what kind of company. You're selling a content marketing product and you're direct calling me right now. How can you reach me with the approach that you're taking? And everybody's like, dude, just don't get it. It's like, no, I've got to teach this person. I know, but all of this <laughs> can be solved if we just get to know our audience. Yep. All of it. You know, and if we stop thinking about what we want first, you know, in lieu of what our customers want, we can solve all of that. And so I think the thing that amazes me the most, probably given the work I do, is how irrelevant almost every communication I get is. You know, I have people sending email like I am a big enterprise company. I got an email the other day asking me to please direct them to my head of voice talent. My head of voice talent. I'm a consultant. Yeah. For God's sakes. I don't have a head of We all know Pamela Meldoon. So yeah, just you know. <laughs> but I mean seriously, I'm like, you know, or and because I research big huge technology solutions because I work for big huge technology companies, I always get the, you know, somebody trying to sell me their five million dollar solution because they can't take five minutes and Google me and go, yeah. oh, consultant, not gonna happen. You know, but I mean, it's kind of like, seriously, yeah. really? And so on that note, let's uh, meet again at another conference soon. And hopefully Absolutely. everyone that's listening will change the way <laughs> so we can progress this conversation further into now that we've solved these initial problems, let's dig deeper. In, I'd love in to. Progress. These are like the conversations that you have in a bar where you're trying to solve the world, world peace, yeah. you know? <laughs> but it's all going to happen soon. We're all going to have to figure this out. And those who will, will hopefully, you know, make it. And so thank you again yeah. for your time. And um, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you.